Today, we're talking about the packaging line. All right, so we are gonna start this video where we ended the last one. We're back in the Bright Tank Farm. We're surrounded by beer that's ready to be packaged, finished beer. Uh, and today we're packaging some King Julius. And Tom's actually purging the line right now. CO2 is making its way through the line to ensure there's no oxygen within this line. And then he's about to turn beer on and we're gonna make our way over to the packaging line. I just wanna talk a little bit about our philosophy here at Treehouse and the way we've always thought about packaging. Packaging is the last step of brewing. It's the last step of brewing. And we've never outsourced packaging to anyone. And early on, back in the months and days when we first invested in a packaging line, it was really hard for us to do so. But having our hands on the product and having control of that process to ensure those packaged oxygen levels were as low as humanly possible were always of critical importance to us. So we're proud to say we've never outsourced packaging and we've always been happy with the result. And today we're really excited to show you guys what we've put together. It's kind of a packaging playground. We have a canning line, we have a bottling line, uh, and then we, we fill kegs by hand. And we're gonna see all that today. We're gonna take you guys through it step by step in as much detail as possible. I'm so excited that we're running King Julius. What a cool one to uh, show off the canning line too. Hi, Dan. This is a working brewery, working environment. Always important to be super careful. Look both ways before crossing. Oh, real quick, I wanted to point this out. In the, in the cellar video, we walked right past the tank that had habanero haze in it, and no one saw it, which is surprising. Come on, guys. So anyway, th that batch that was in the tank in the cellar video, which if you go back, the writing on the tank was different. And this guy, uh, that was a failed attempt. We actually dumped that batch, and then we made another one. And this one turned out beautiful. Before we started at the beginning of the line, I just wanted to point out that right now Walt is filling the bowl. The bowl is essentially a highly regulated pressurized device on top of the packaging line that delivers product to the fill heads. And bef before we start running, we have to make sure everything is flush with CO2, everything is purged really well, and that that liquid is pressurized to the appropriate amount within that bowl. And as you can see, Tom just started up the filler, can just started running right now. We're gonna make our way back over to the start of the packaging line. We're back at, at the very, very beginning of the packaging line. The first step is the infeed of, of uh, unfilled cans, obviously. In this case, we have pre-printed cans that are loaded on the, on the tray here. This is a depalletizing piece of equipment that has several other functions. It basically deconstructs this pallet automatically once you've clipped these little, once these bands have been clipped and you've loaded a pallet onto this line, full pallet release button is right here. The name of the game, once again, is you know automation and sensors. So this sensor right here is telling this pallet, that this sensor right here is picking up that this pallet is here and telling it to stop until the operator says that it's okay to move along. And you can see right now that this is a pneumatic device that raises up and down and lifts one row off and delivers it to the packaging line at a time. And then an arm comes down with suction cups, grabs this slip sheet, and then delivers it over here to this holding tray where we can offload it later on. This is really cool that this is running in the moment. There goes a row as we speak. Nice. So one little fun fact about this packaging line, specifically the canning line, is we package both 16 ounce cans and 12 ounce cans. We can change over all of the equipment, the height of the fill heads, the twist rinse, all of the things that make this packaging line run a certain size can, we can change over in about 45 minutes. So if we're, if we're packaging a 16 ounce and then we move into a 12 ounce, 45 minutes later we can switch between the two. There's about 6,224 cans on every 16 ounce can pallet that's blank and 16 rows high. And then the 12 ounce can pallets have 8,169 cans and they're 21 rows high. Just some fun facts for you out there. So we'll keep rolling, Michael. 
Uh, this here is a manual intervention. The depalletizer will automatically pull this, this sheet off, which helps you band the, the cans together with, on the pallet over here and drop it into the slip sheet case. That only comes about you know once every pallet, so an operator has to be on the ball and open up this device right here, pull this out and stack it separately. And then the slip sheets are stacked automatically. So here's the offloading section. Cans are making their way to the packaging line. Uh, this is a sensor right here, I believe, that will tell that that will tell the depalletizer that there's enough room to load another row of cans on. Obviously, if this is not coordinated, you're gonna have an issue where that sweep arm winds up crunching the can. So it's important that this sensor is working accurately at all times. I should say the packaging line is completely loaded with sensors from start to finish. Most of them are just um, indicators that cans are, are on the line because we don't want cans to move too quickly and have things back up on the line. Back pressure is always a bad thing on a packaging line. And then the last step to the depal, once this pallet is empty, the actual pallet that it came on is conveyed underneath the depalletizer makes its way onto this conveyor and then gets stacked automatically right here for a fork truck operator to later unload this once this builds an entire stack. But again, very, very cool, fully automated depalletizer. It works well 99.99% of the time. Of course, as those of you that work in a brewery know, when it doesn't work well, it can be quite the train wreck. But uh, fortunately for us, it works well most of the time. Throughout the packaging line, you'll see a number of belt drives, motors that, I think these guys are one horsepower, and these all feed into a centralized control unit that we'll see in just a second, the belt drive controller, but they're all highly coordinated once again to deliver cans at a consistent rate when required by the filler. Filler is kind of like the mother bee of the entire operation, communicating out to the packaging line what speed the filler is running at so that your belt drives and your conveyors run to match that throughput level. Right now, for the purpose of the video, we're running at about 150 cans a minute, which is actually kind of slow. We can push this can line up to 300 cans per minute if necessary, but just so Michael and I have enough time to make our way around here, we're running a little bit slower for the, for the video. So yeah, we've seen the depalletizer. We've talked about the pumps. This, this over here is actually This is our belt drive control module, and this is actually really simple. On this packaging line, which we'll see in just a minute, we fill proper cans, obviously, and then we fill cans that are labeled. And the cans that are labeled require a slightly different configuration over on this side of the packaging line, which can be controlled by this belt, you know, this belt drive control system right here. You have recipes that are pre-built in. For example, if we're running 16 ounce labels, very, very simple. Load the 16 ounce label recipe load it, hit go, main screen, and then out over on this side where the label machine is. Uh, different things happen on the conveyance line to enable that to work flawlessly. What? Oh, so this is actually a funny story. I can, I asked the guys about this. Apparently Dan, Dan Rem, one of our uh, packaging line associates, his, what was the story? His daughter hit his wife with this and she said, get rid of this thing. So he brought it here and it's on display on the packaging line. Uh, there's a lot of little packaging line guys have like sort of this, they need mojo, like uh, Joe Boo in the, the movie Major League. They have all these weird little, I guess they found this in the parking lot. I'm not sure what that's all about. But yeah, packaging lines, there's always a little bit of juju that has to go on to make everything work the way that it's supposed to. Let's say we're gonna make our way kind of inside. There's a couple more modules right here that I want to talk about. But before we do that, I just want to, again, talk philosophically about packaging and how important it is to be locked in. Obviously, these cans are open atmosphere. And for a very brief moment in time, the beer, for the first time in its existence, sees the open atmosphere. And as we'll see in just a minute, getting oxygen into this can is something that we do not allow to happen virtually at all. Uh, we'll talk a little bit once we get over to the can piercer about just how low our total package auction levels are. But rest assured, we've done everything in our power to design this packaging line custom for our needs so that beer makes its way into these little vessels, these beautiful little kegs, 
uh, in as ideal condition as humanly possible. So a couple of modules to see over here. You have the boot dryer, which if you work in a brewery, you know this thing is a godsend. Don't forget to put your boots on the boot dryer. It will always make for a miserable morning if you come into wet boots. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot to see in here. We're just gonna bomb through it. Date coder, we can obviously, cha we can obviously change the date code to say whatever we would like. Uh, you know, happy, Merry Christmas or Happy Birthday, Michael, or any number of things that we wanna put on there. Pretty straightforward stuff. All of our cans get date coded. Uh, if we move on right here, this is a ionizer air rinser. So the can comes in, gets flipped, gets rinsed as it makes its way through. And as it makes its way through, this is actually where the date coder is located. And then it gets one more pop on the way out as it makes its way over to the filler. This, this part right here is really important because before this module, the can is exposed to what's above it. And then it gets rinsed with fresh air, makes its way in here, and it has this ceiling above it so that nothing from atmosphere can make its way into this beautifully rinsed can as it makes its way over to the filler. One more thing to look at here, Michael. So obviously these 12 ounce cans have, or these 16 ounce cans rather, have to run through this module and they get rinsed as it goes. This is a very precise machine piece of equipment right here. And when we make that change over to 12 ounce cans, the operators here have to swap this guy out for the 12 ounce module, which is sitting right here. So again, flexibility is the name of the game. We're able to package different formats, kind of depending on the mood, the season, the beer, and so on and so forth. We love the flexibility. It's awesome. So yeah, we're rolling. Cans have now been, they've been dated. They've been flushed with fresh air and they're making their way over to the filler. I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna walk right around you this way, Michael. Point a couple things out as I see them. This is a flow meter, obviously, that's giving feedback on the volume of beer that's being delivered to the filler. One of the things the can line boys like to do, especially when we have a proper can on the line, is essentially guess when to cut off the depalletizer. Because if we don't guess right, we wind up with roughly, I think over a thousand cans on the line that have to be packed off by hand. So the flow meter helps to give us the information that we need to cut the depalletizer off so the line can be cleared of all these proper cans. Otherwise, it's a manual thing that we have to do before running cans that have labels. I mean, this is the filler itself, KHS, top of the line. We had a Crohn's filler previously. Uh, we, had, we had some challenges with it, but KHS for us was the next step. In fact, this is kind of, kind of a nice time to tell a fun little story about Treehouse and the way that we operate. These cans often make their way out to another location the day of packaging, the morning of packaging. So this packaging line team typically starts their day at 4 a.m. and starts cranking on cans to make sure that they're ready for you, the customer, at open. And even here in Charlton, that, that time is 11 o'clock in the morning. So this filler is an upgrade from our original filler here in Charlton. We had a 24 head Cronus filler and upgraded to a 36 head KHS filler to increase the throughput of the packaging line while lowering our total package oxygen levels but also making sure that all of the day's beers were delivered to retail for sale that day, which is remarkably difficult. I can't stress to you enough how much time, energy, investment, know-how we've put into this equipment to make sure not only it can be packaged as well as humanly possible, but again, ready for you at retail. This is a physical thing. Team has to work hard. I'm impressed by it every day. So let's check out the filler. There's a lot to geek out on this thing. I won't get too into the weeds. Much like the brew house, uh, all your valves are actuated by air. They're providing electrical feedback into this, this PLC unit, which has a GUI around the corner. Uh, again, it's, it's similar to much of the other equipment that we've seen so far. You have modulating CO2 valves right here that enable you know, your CO2 to adjust as necessary to deliver product to the filler at the right pressure without breaking out into foam. This is an inline CO2 sensor. You have a temperature sensor on the other side. And these guys, again, are just delivering feedback into the unit over here so that Walt over here can see what's going on at any time. So one more thing, obviously, you know, un unseen cans making their way into the filler. This is our lid, lid tray right here. And historically, we kind of always had 
just this little tray that came out of the filler that every like you know minute or two the operator would have to put cans onto the onto the tray to feed the, the canning line. But in the past year, we made this investment in this amazing device that'll hold 7,800 uh, lids so that the operator can load this guy up and kind of forget about it for a while. Which again, if you're loading lids by hand, utilizing a, a, a smaller filler or even a filler of this size without one of these bad boys, it is a life changer to invest in one for sure. Again, because each, each uh, sleeve of lids, you can see the stack right over here, only holds 580 lids. And again, a typical in-feed for these lids is around one and a half of these bad boys. So to have this guy, which holds 10 or more, is amazing. So we'll keep making our way over. This machine will run up to 300 cans per minute. But again, for the purposes of this video, we slowed it down a little bit. So Michael and I would have some time to make our way around. But anyway, if you come on over here, these cans are filled under counter pressure. So obviously the bowl up there is full of beer, uh, pressurized system. Beer makes its way through fill tubes that are contained within the, bowl, within the circle right here. And then CO2 is flushed into the can, air exits out the top, and then the fill head comes down, grabs the can, creates a seal, and fills it very, very gently like a fan down the side of the can, while at the same time opening an ex exhale valve that's enabling the display CO2 to make its way out of the can. This is a very, very, very gentle way of filling the can. It's filled completely under counter pressure. The beer is only exposed to atmosphere for a brief split second as it makes its way from the fill head over to the bubble breaker. This is where the beer is the most vulnerable. We have spent countless hours dialing in this system, measuring uh, TPO levels, which is total package oxygen, of each fill head precisely as it makes its way around to ensure everyone is dialed in exactly as it needs to be. Not only that, the fill heads themselves have feedback sensors that if a seal is informed, if there's the chance of oxygen ingress, we know about it on this, on this machine right here. So again, this is where the beer is most vulnerable. It's a split second where it's exposed to, to atmosphere per se, but it's, it's riding on a blanket of CO2. And then there's two more steps to protect that beer before it's seamed and makes its way into a case. And what happens right under here, which you may or may not be able to see, is there's what's called a bubble break. So any bubbles that develop during the filling process that may catch oxygen when it's exposed to atmosphere are broken by what's called this bubble break device under here. And then the very, very last step, overkill, if you will, if right, as the, right as the lid goes onto the can, there's an undergas device that slices that it slices that headspace one more time with CO2, literally, literally as the as the lid makes its way onto the can. So, CO2 purge counterfill comes on over CO2 bubble break. It gets sliced with CO2 as the lid goes on, and then it gets sealed once and for all. Such an awesome system. There's no there's nothing that touches the beer on its way down. There's no fill tube. There's nothing like that. Very gentle. Very custom designed just to make sure this beer is packaged as, as pristinely as humanly possible. That stainless device right here, it's obviously not functional right now, but when we package cold brew, for example, that's a nitrogen dosing system that we utilize for nitrogen infused cold brew. So customized portion of this packaging line specific for our product needs. Make our way over, you can kind of see the seamer right here, cranking away. I think there's eight, eight seamers on the chuck. So yeah, that's it. Now the can has been seamed. You got beer within the can and life is good. Making its way right along the line here. Gets a quick rinse. Any, any residual beer that might be left on the can gets a rinse right here. Then immediately it makes its way through an air dryer. Uh, gets dried so that that can doesn't have any residual beer on it. Real quick guys, we had to hold the roll right there. We jumped around because there's something that I wanted to see you uh, to show you rather on this side of the packaging line. This device right here is an x-ray unit. So as the can makes its way through, every single can gets x-rayed to measure the amount of headspace in the can, which obviously calculates into the volume of liquid. If for some reason there's a volume of liquid that's determined to be inadequate in the can below the stated volume on the can, this little chuck right here will knock the can off into the bucket. Sorry, this is a good can of KJ. Once again, that's going in my pocket. 
Uh, actually, you know what? Quality control. Can we can we do this live? Oh, baby. <laughs> Dialed in. Uh, excuse me. So, if the if the X-ray machine determines the can to be underfilled, this truck right here knocks it off into the bucket. One other thing I wanted to show you while we're here is a brand new investment that we just made. This is actually a can crusher. It's not hooked up yet. We've only used it manually by hand. But over time, rather than the rather than the trash can right here, this those cans will get kicked off into this crushing device. This crushing device kicks off completely compressed aluminum in half pound or sorry, two pound chucks that come off the end of it. And on the other side, through this pump on the bottom, it delivers the liquid that's been crushed out of that can. So what we're able to do in this moment is we take what would be waste otherwise, it makes its way down to our distillery where we distill it into reusable, you know, isopropyl products that we utilize at a later time. So really excited about this. It's a, it's a, again, a, a, it's a investment that protects us from having to dispose of things, to put things into the trash, and we're able to reuse it, which we feel really, really good about. Because normally, again, the things that get kicked off, there's no good use for these cans. And the last thing I'll say while we're here in terms of quality control is that in spite of the fact that we don't necessarily need to, the startup of every run runs through a completely clean machine, but just to be totally safe in terms of whether or not that line was fully packed with beer, we pull the first three cases of every packaging run and we, we put them aside just to make sure that everything is perfect and we're running at full gas with no auction ingress before those cans go out to market. This portion of the line right here is just an accumulation tray. Uh, again, normally we're running printed cans right now, but if we had labels for this particular brand, if you have an issue with the label machine, which is over here, you can accumulate you know, several thousand cans onto this table so you can catch up over there and not stop your filler. So we actually have limited accumulation here and we run very, very lean, A, because we don't have a lot of space, and B, because we try not to be down too often, because every time the filler stops, any, any flexible hose, there's potential for auction ingress. So the filler stopping is always bad news over here. So yeah, accumulation table, make our way over in this direction. This, this is kind of cool to point out. This little juncture right here, we're making our way to the left, Michael, and if you swing around to your right, you can see the cans are making their way along the back wall. To the right is our labeling machine. So. If we're running blank cans and labeling, we're gonna divide this little divider right here to send cans through the label machine. This is, uh, this is our labeling machine, it's called a Quadrel. It's a no downtime labeling machine because it has redundant labeling heads. It can label up to 400 cans per minute, which is very cool to see in action. Maybe we'll catch some B-roll later on. But anyway, basically the way that it works is you can fill up one side of this with labels, the other side with the same label, and as you're running a brand, when this side runs out, you switch to this side, and that enables you to reload this side, again, so that you don't have to stop your filler and risk oxygen ingress on the filling side of things. So, this is great. I mean, back in Munson, when we first started on the Wild Goose, we were canning 32 cans per minute, right? 32 cans per minute. And when we were done with those packaging runs, we used to sit there with all of us, and my parents, and my wife's parents, and we would literally, for the first six months, put labels onto cans by hand. So through, I think, uh, something like September or October of 2015, every treehouse can, something like five or six months that went out the door, we labeled by hand. So thank you, machine, for saving us from doing that ever again. This is kind of neat. I just want to point this out. So most, most of the motors that we see on the packaging line are these, these uh, similar, I guess, blue one horsepower motors that are all coordinated. This guy here is a different motor because the labeling machine itself, sorry, you can't really see it, it's right around here. The labeling machine itself talks to each of these motors and either throttles or speeds up its respective conveyor to make sure the labeling machine can dial in the labels exactly as we need 
them to be. So yeah, we got beer in cans. It's making its way on the conveyor. Happy little King Julius cans. Let's see what the fellas did for a date code. It's good to be the king. Nice. Badass. I like that. Uh, so yeah, we're making our way. Once again, we have an accumulation table. And the reason we have an accumulation table here is in advance of the tray packing machine, which Corey is working as we speak. Make our way over, say hi to Corey. So right here we have unfolded boxes. The machine is gonna fold these boxes for us, apply a glue layer, and then fold the boxes around a case of 24 beers. So this is the second switchback that we've had. The first one had some issues. This new one has had a ton of upgrades. It actually works really well for us. One of the things that's really nice is it has a back pressure accumulation, which over here on the left, you can see the cans making their way around. Previously, if you had an issue in that infeed, the cans would back up, you would have can explosions, you would have to shut the machine down. But that little roundabout enables that pressure to be taken off, which again, allows for less downtime on the line, which has worked out really well for us. So cans make their way in, they're arranged six by four, Automatically, they push it in the machine, come around here. You see the cans as they get, they first get arranged into the case, which is six by four, and then the hand pulls them into the box that's been folded automatically. A little shot of glue gets applied, and then the box finally gets folded right there, hot glue, and then it dries relatively instantly. And then the last step is it gets kicked off onto the automated conveyor. This electrical conveyor brings the cans down And from here, the last step is simply palletization. Again, uh, early on here at Treehouse on the old on the old packaging line, the 24 head filler, we had a circular table and we had you know operators here at the end that would physically have to remove those cases and put them on a turn turntable and palletize by hand and wrap by hand. We made the investment in the top tier, so cases come down, they get sent into the machine here, a little arm automatically configures them the way that they need to be configured and then the push arm slides them out. This device here puts them onto the pallet, arranges it exactly as we would like. Um, 16 ounce cans go eight high, 12 ounce cans go 10 high. And then once that's configured, it gets wrapped in shrink wrap and sent off on its way into the cold storage. Every four minutes we get a full pallet of the king making its way off of this line and hopefully into your loving embrace. Right after the packaging run, Corey will come over here and utilize the can piercing device. Throughout the course of the week, we pull cans off of the line that are numbered to check the, the package auction levels from every single fill head sequentially. Because sometimes if you have a gasket that's off or if something is going on in the fill head, you can have auction ingress that you didn't expect. So throughout the week, every batch, every run, we put through the can piercer. All right, so we saw the packaging line, some KJ running, that was super fun. This is only our first stop on the packaging line tour. We're next gonna make our way over to the bottle filler. As we do, I'd be remiss not to mention the packaging line team here. Again, as I said, I think somewhere in the middle of the video, they get here often four o'clock in the morning to get this guy fired up to get you beer each and every day. And they, it means a lot to them that they do it. And to see them do it day in and day out is impressive as hell. So needed to throw that out there, needed to give the team some props and we'll see you over at the bottle line. All right, so we are now at the bottling line. Michael told me I only have three minutes over here. So I'm gonna go as quick as I can while being as lucid as possible. So automated bottling line, we have uh, sort of this little deboxer over here that you load the full case trays on. Bottles get lifted off. They get placed onto the bottling line. They make their way around the corner over here. They come through the uh, ionized air rinse. They get twist rinsed. And then once again, much like the can line that we saw earlier, they come under the, the little ceiling right here and they make their way on over to the filler. This is a 36 head filler. It's actually very much overkill for what we need on the bottling line, but we purchased this filler primarily because this manufacturer, KHS, could promise the lowest dissolved oxygen 
levels on the market, uh, far exceeding the levels on the low end of any other manufacturer. So even though this is a little bit overkill for what we do, this is the bottling line that made the most sense for us. So anyway, much like the can line, uh, bottles come in, they're filled under counter pressure, where they move on over to the capper, where they're always capped on foam, expelling any potential for oxygen in the headspace of the can. And the uh, dissolved oxygen levels ultimately on this bottle filler are very, very exceedingly low, which we're happy about. So <clears throat> one more thing to see on the filler over here, we have you know, an automatic cap conveyor, which is good. Back in the early days, we used to have to climb up there on a ladder and it was pretty unsafe. But fortunately, we invested in this little device that lets us dump the um, can tabs directly into here, can caps, and they make their way on up. Once the bottle is filled, it comes under a rinser where it gets rinsed, makes its way around. And again, like the canning line, we have an air dryer. When the bottles, once the bottle's been rinsed, it gets air dried very quickly before making its way through the labeler right here. You know, because this is a secondary packaging line for us, we, don't ha we didn't have the budget to install the redundant labeler. So we do have the single labeler here that if it gives us a problem, it is a problem and we have to stop the filler. But fortunately, because we don't run the bottle line that often, that almost never happens. So again, once the bottle has been labeled, we make our way around here. And the last step is it goes into the cartonizer. Again, you can see this little device right here when you, when you decart in the bottles, you put the box on the little conveyor, brings it on over to here, and then feeds the cartonizer, which is the last step of the bottling process. And from there, we hand palletize the uh, bottles and they make their way down to finished good storage, which we'll see in just a minute. I think that was four minutes. Yeah, but we forgot to talk about that. Okay. So one more thing before we head off away from bottling feel like we're kind of, maybe we'll make a separate video on this one, but for the time being, we'll just kind of run through it quickly. What you're looking at here are changeover parts. So we've invested in the capability to package both 12 ounce bottles, 500 milliliter bottles, and actually 750 milliliter bottles, all utilizing the same packaging line. And we really had to push our friends over at KHS to do the 750s because the tolerances were less than a millimeter and I think we actually signed off on being okay with being outside of their tolerance for the bottle making its way through the filler. But so far we've used it several times and we haven't had an issue. So again, seeing this guy in action is much cool, much cooler than seeing it stagnant. But again, for the purposes of the packaging video, we just wanted to show it to you guys really quickly. All right, so we're gonna talk about kegging really quick. Uh, here at Treehouse, many times we've investigated an automated washer and filler, and every time we've gone down that road, we kind of do the math and we think about the way that we operate, and it just doesn't make sense for us. So cleaning kegs is still by hand using a semi-automated piece of equipment, and filling kegs is still by hand. In just a second, we'll show you a manifold that we utilize, but basically it's just a tri-clamp connection to five other tri-clamp connections that enable you to have five fill heads at the same time, and you'll go directly into a bright tank with finished beer, make that connection, and then fill those kegs by hand, which I actually really appreciate because you can fill them low and slow. And a lot of the automated fillers, they really kind of blast beer into the keg. And once again, filling gently by hand, controlling the flow of the beer into the keg ensures that it gets kegged in optimal condition. And so again, cleaning we do semi-automatically. Semi Kevin here is loading kegs up to be cleaned as we speak and then Again, we fill by hand, which I'll show you in just a second. All right, so real quick, quick kegging demonstration. This is not hooked up to a, a usable tank at the moment. I'm just gonna show you guys how we do it. Again, we have the multi-tap manifold right here. It runs into a keg filling head. You put this guy onto a Sankey valve. This guy goes on, you clamp it down. Right now, this keg is pressurized to a certain volume that we know is less than the tank. So when you open the fill head, that's going to enable liquid to flow into the keg comfortably. Once you've hit equalization on your pressures, this will stop filling. And at that point, you have to bleed the CO2 out of your keg. So again, you fill it under pressure from the bottom and you fill this keg right on up until the top. And then once you get foam spitting out of here or clear beer, you turn that guy off and you have a full, a full keg. Again, old school, we fill them by hand. Low and slow is the name of the game. And uh, 
that's how we do it. All right, we've seen can line, we've seen the bottle line, we've seen kegging. So real quick to kind of wrap this video up, I'm gonna show you guys finished goods. We have two coolers, one large one downstairs and then another one upstairs. But we'll, we'll look at the one downstairs first because I think it's one of the coolest visuals in Treehouse. Come on in, welcome. Finished goods. So this is actually interesting. Typically we try to run between four and 10 days of total inventory. So everything that you see in this cooler roughly will get turned around in between four to 10 days. Sometimes we get a little high, especially around the holidays and the summer months. But typically we try to run an average age, or I should say we manage all of our freshness of our hoppy beer specifically in absolutes. So we try to run an average age somewhere between three and 10 days. And when we're doing that, we feel super comfortable that you guys are getting the very, very best and most fresh product humanly possible. All right, so we're all the way upstairs now. The last thing I wanna show you guys in the packaging line journey is the upstairs finished goods cooler. If you've been a customer here at Treehouse, you know that we're exiting the retail shop right now and heading into the cooler where your beer comes out fresh. And I just wanna show you guys the wild assortment of things we typically have in stock at any one time and just show you how much cooler space is required to keep our beer as fresh as possible. So here's the finished goods cooler. Another thing I want to point out is that during the slower months, the winter months, we pack cans in the cooler itself so that beer doesn't sit out. In the summer months where it's warmer, we have a kind of a stated rule of a 10 to 20 minute turnaround time for beer that sits out to be packed to go. But long story short, the chain of command, the chain of custody for our beer is that it remains cold at all times before it winds up in your hands. And this is the last step of that journey. So if you've always wondered what's behind that big can sign out in the retail shop, this is it. All right, so when you're here at Treehouse and you buy this beer, you've seen how much love and care goes into putting it in the cans. We ask that you keep it cold at all times. When you buy it, it goes directly into the cooler, directly into the fridge. All right, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoyed this. If you want to see something in the future, consider leaving a comment. Uh, and for the next video, we're going to take a look at our warehouse, which is right behind me.